Welcome to this presentation where I'm going to be discussing the Japanese economy in some detail, mainly an overview, but by the end of this presentation you will understand how Japan can be in debt but also a major lender to other countries. If we look at the agenda, I'm going to discuss some facts that I think you'll be interested in the Japanese economy that you might not know and then I'm going to break it down, discuss the Japanese debt situation and also how they can be lending and, and bailing out the eurozone and things like that. So my name's Levi, I studied economics and maths and then went on to study a master's degree in risk. I'm also the author of a book called Investment Economics and Risk and the Economics of Entrepreneurship. So some general facts then. Japanese public debt as a percentage of income is the highest in the world. That's according to official data. And, and the reason why I put that on there is that it makes sense in a way for the Japanese government to say that their debt situation is worse than what it actually is. I mean, I'm not saying this is the case, but if you look at how the US has uh, sort of interacted with China, or putting tariffs on and things like that, if Japan says, yes, OK, well, we're selling more goods and services to you than what you're selling to us, but we've got this massive situation with debt, then maybe they go under the radar for a little bit. You know, it makes sense to say our debt situation is worse than what it is. Japan is the largest creditor nation of the world. It's, the, it's got the oldest um, age demographic and it's the third largest economy behind the US and China at, my, at the moment. Something that's quite interesting that came up in my research is the lost decade. Now, uh, I obviously studied economics and Japan and Japan's economy came up quite a lot. They had a, a boom and then they had what's deemed as the, the lost decade where GDP started to fall leading economic indicators were saying that the economy isn't doing that well anymore and people called it the lost decade. Japan made no progress. But actually, if you look at the chart on the left, you can see that Japan did make progress. The, the Japanese companies were deleveraging. During the boom, they were more than happy to get in debt. Everyone was making more and more money. There was loads of capital flowing around the economy. Debt wasn't really an issue. When things started to stall, people realized that actually we're in quite a lot of debt here. There's the gearing was quite high, so let's start paying off and deleveraging. So the lost decade was a period of balance sheet improvement by Japanese companies, and I think that's quite important to notice. Something that's quite interesting as well is Japan is quite heavily reliant on uh, importing food. And uh, you can see here that the, the UK population is about half of Japan's, but when you look at the amount of land, uh, you can see that Japan's obviously quite uh, densely populated compared to the UK. And uh, you can't see it because of the camera, but Japan's, uh, the amount of land in Japan that can be used for growing crops is about 13%, whereas in the UK it's about 70%. So there's, I've never been to Japan, but I understand it's quite mountainous, unsuitable for farming, which is why they are importing a lot of their food. And they've uh, got a very uh, old population, I suppose you could say. When you look at the percentage of the population that's over 65, it's the highest in the world. And uh, one of the things that they could do is um, they could improve this by opening up the floodgates to immigration, let lots of young families come to Japan to work. Uh, the difficult thing with that is that not a lot of countries uh, speak Japan other than Japanese, sorry, other than Japan. So it's not as easy just to import um, people like the, the UK. A lot of European people uh, speak English. So it's, it's quite simple to keep the UK's population down just by encouraging immigration. And you can see the UK is not in the top 10 here. So now we get to discussing the debt situation because I've read a lot of uh, media headlines saying Japan's in trouble with their debt, their debt's skyrocketing and it, it's um, everyone always uses the, the phrase that compared to income, their debt is the highest in the world. Uh, the second highest is Greece, but they are, when you look at the stats uh, relative to GDP, Japan is, is leading by a lot it, it's um that's why a lot of people think japan is heading for a crisis but then 
if that's the case, how can they also be the biggest creditor nation? So they're lending to other countries. So it sort of seems a bit of a paradox, it doesn't quite make sense. By the end of this video, as promised, you'll understand. So let's break it down. Over the last 30 years, Japan, as you can see on the bottom right chart, they've been the biggest creditor nation. When it comes to building foreign assets, Japan, they are, they're the top dog. And a lot of this takes the form of building factories abroad. If you're a car manufacturing company, you want to uh, set up in Europe to access some of the, the markets in Europe. So you build factories, which is a massive source of investment abroad and also mergers and acquisitions. Uh, there's a lot of Japanese companies buying up European firms, US companies as well. And that is a massive source of outflow. So that's part of the reason why uh, the uh, Japan is a ma major creditor. But there's other reasons and I'm going to go into that now. Uh, before I do, sorry, this is uh, some foreign direct investment of Japanese companies in Australia. Uh, I won't go into the too much detail, but the point I want to make here is that these are billion dollar deals. They're billion dollar acquisitions that it's, it's major investment flowing out of Japan. And I'll explain how they can do that as well, because they've got something that's called a current account. Uh, surplus which I'll get into at the end of the, the presentation but something that people might not realize is Japan has the biggest pension fund in the world and it has over 1.5 trillion dollars of assets now interestingly 25% of their funds are invested in foreign bonds with a, a standard deviation of 6% so that basically means up to 31% of their capital can be bought uh, can be uh, used to purchase foreign bonds, which is basically a way that Japan can lend to foreign governments, just, just buy up their bonds. And 25% can be uh, of the funds can be invested in stock markets and uh, equities. I believe that this, this pension fund is a massive investor in the US market. Uh, the remainder is invested in domestic bonds and equities, which of course, when you buy domestic bonds, you're buying up uh, Japanese government debt. So you can sort of see where some of this debt is coming from. It's uh, Japan lending to itself in a funny way. Uh, and obviously I've put as a last point that the pension company is a massive source of outflow investment. But when you actually look at, and, and this is really important because debt isn't necessarily a bad thing if, if a country is getting into debt and they're building infrastructure say if you're Kenya and you're built you're getting into debt you're selling bonds to foreign investors and with that that capital you're investing in infrastructure for foreign companies to come and bring their plants and set up production in Kenya debt is brilliant it's it's when there's unproductive debt but the other thing with debt that people don't realize is it matters who owns the debt and you can see on the left hand side, Japan, only a, according to this source, 10% of government debt is, is foreign companies or foreign governments. When you look at France, 60% is foreigners. So the Bank of Japan is the biggest single uh, owner of government debt. So basically, if the government get into trouble, they can just print yen. They, they've, they've not borrowed in US dollars like uh, I think it was Turkey that had issues because they borrowed in US dollars. And then the, uh, the, Tur the Turkish lira fell against the US dollar, which made it harder to pay back the, the debt that they borrowed uh, in a foreign currency. Japan doesn't have that problem. They borrowed in yen. So they can just print yen if they need to. So even though the debt is quite high, according to what the government's telling us, um, it's not too much of an issue compared to uh, countries like Greece. And this is why Greece had that, that trouble. Um, I think it's around 2011, 2012, because they borrowed too much. People thought it was safer because they was a Eurozone member. They was like, well, if Greece can't pay, then part of the Eurozone will, someone in the Eurozone will help bail them out. Greece borrowed in a cunt in a in a, in euros um, and they don't have facility to just print euros unfettered so it was uh, it was a different situation to what you see in Japan now before we go any further I want to just discuss or just very quickly just uh, go over the uh, sort of composition of an economy you've got private sector which is households and firms you've got the public sector which is the government and you've got the external sector, which is basically international trade. And this is quite important because 
this is how we get to the bottom of how Japan can be uh, a creditor and also a debtor because there's part of the economy that's the creditor and there's part of the economy that's the debtor and we'll get into that. And something that I, I can't go into too much detail because it does get quite technical, uh, but the macroeconomic accounting identity says that if, if there is a debtor, then there must be someone on the other side of that transaction who's lending that amount. The, the world cannot be in debt. The world, uh, and I've seen it, the reason why I say that is because I've seen this on um, online that the world is in debt. The world is not in debt. For every for every debt that's taken out, there's someone on the end of that transaction who's lending, and and Japan is a massive creditor. The oil um, oil exporters are. China is as well. Uh, but the point I want to make here is that. When we look at the private sector and the public sector and the external sector, the situation with Japan is that the government, so this is the public sector, the government, they are the ones in debt. The private sector are the ones that have surplus of capital. So as we mentioned in a uh, few slides back, the, the Bank of Japan is one of the biggest or, or these, the single largest uh, owner of government debt so what you've effectively got is the private sector is lending to the government so the private sector selling more goods and services abroad they're building up this capital they're buying government bonds as an investment um, if you look at uh, insurance companies some of them have to they have to buy uh, invest some of their capital in in bonds which the government can benefit from and also the external sector because um, the thing is that what you can have in an economy is the private sector and the public sector in deficit and basically they're borrowing from abroad, which is similar to the US and uh, UK economy. But in, in um, Japan, what you've got is the private sector are generating surplus funds, so they are lending, the government are in debt, and also um, Japan is sending money abroad to buy up foreign bonds as well. So this, what you're seeing on the screen now, is the situation in Japan. And how this happens is that there's something called a current account and a capital account, which I'm going to briefly go over so that you can uh, understand what's going on. So the current account is the is the sort of uh, way of accounting what's happening with international trade. If you have a current account in surplus, which is what Japan has, basically what that means is that overseas buy more Japanese goods than Japan buys from overseas. So they are Japanese companies are selling more to foreign consumers than what uh, foreign companies are, are selling to Japanese consumers. And if you have a current account surplus, what that means is that you'll have a capital account deficit because a capital account is the flow of money. So if you have a capital account deficit, it means that you're sending money abroad, you're investing abroad, you're buying up um, assets abroad, you're lending to other countries. Because like I say, not every country in the world can be a creditor. Someone has to be a debtor. And with the case with Japan, they have a current account uh, surplus, which means that they're, they're bringing in more money than what's flowing out. Uh, and basically they're sending it back out as investments, they're buying up foreign assets. And here what we have is uh, the government, as I've said, the government are the ones borrowing the money and where the private sector is doing quite well, the, the Japanese companies are buying, uh, sorry, they're selling a lot of goods abroad. They're generating capital. They're using that to buy up government bonds, which is a form of buying debt basically. Uh, and the external sector as well. So Japanese companies are, are investing abroad, which means that there's a surplus of uh, funds in the external sector, which is international trade. And that's pretty much it. If you want to check out my books, uh, as I said, Investment Economics and Risk and also the Economics of Entrepreneurship. If you go onto Amazon, you can actually look inside so you can have a sneak peek of uh, what's in these books and also read some of the sections in there, which I hope that you'll find interesting. It took me a long time to write them books. And uh, subscribe because I will be doing more videos like this. And uh, if you have any requests, just drop them in the comments below and I will see what I can do. I appreciate your time. Thank you.